recording. Oh, hold on. Let me just go back here. I don't know what I've just done there. So let's just bring you back in. Perfect. Are we recording? Yep, we are. Fab. All right, let's do it. Dr. Allen, welcome. It is fab to have you here with me today. Um, firstly, a massive thank you to everything you've done, by the way, over the last year and many years. But I think it's been highlighted to us all the wonderful work that the NHS and, and the frontline workers have done over the last year to keep many of us alive and well and, and healthy and also deal with what must have been an incredibly pressured time. And on top of that, you've continued this amazing work in the whole food, plant-based, nutritional world. I just think it's, it's a massive feather in your cap. And I just wanted to thank you before we even kick off, let alone all the other wonderful things that you've done. You're an absolute superstar in my eyes, my man. Oh, thanks, Andy. From Coming from you, that means an awful lot. So thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I'll take it. I'll take it. You take it all day long. Let's take it on a Saturday morning. So where I wanted to go with this today really is to sort of find out the story behind your story, how you've ended up in this place of meaning and purpose. And not only yeah. as, you know, in the medical professional, uh, as a gastroenterologist, but also in the world now of, of, of nutrition, you know. So I thought we'd start back in Ireland. You've got this lovely Irish accent that's shining through. I've got such a soft spot for Ireland. As many people know, how did you, well, where did you grow up and how did you end up over in the UK? Yeah, so I grew up in Cork. Um, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents all came from a small area in Cork City called Blackpool, like Blackpool in the UK, but yeah. it's pronounced a little bit differently. Without Blackpool. the rock. Yeah, yeah, without the rock. So Blackpool, um, which is basically, you know, part of almost in the city centre. Um, so they all grew up there. Um, my parents, when they married in 73, moved out, or 71 probably, moved out to the suburbs, moved out to a village called Blarney, uh, which is about five miles outside of, Blarney, out, outside of Cork City. And Blarney is a tourist town. It's where the Blarney Castle is, the Blarney Stone. Um, so as a kid growing up in a tourist town, it's actually quite nice because you feel like you're growing up in a yeah. special town. There's like busloads of tourists coming and going the whole time, especially American tourists, actually. So Blarney would be, you know, almost like a mandatory pilgrimage for like Irish mecca. Americans. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like the Mecca for Irish Americans. So we would have, you know, bus loads of tourists. I remember being a little boy walking to school and you would often have some American tourists would spot you walking to school in your school uniform. And they'd be like, oh my God, honey, look at these cute Irish school boys, yeah. you know? And you'd stop and you'd get a photograph with them and they'd give you 50 pence, you know? So so that was the vibe growing up in Blarney, you know? It was, we kind of felt important. We were on the map. Yeah, and it's, it's, um, it is such a beautiful place. And, and Cork in general, I've got a really big soft spot for, for Cork, our family, Driscolls, were from Cork. I mean, so many people have got this this wonderful Irish heritage. As soon as you go back a bit further, my wife's family are from Skibbereen and a little island called Bear Island, which sits just off C Castletown Bear, which is like 10 kilometres by three kilometres, about 250 people on that beautiful island. We spend many, so much of our summers there. I mean, Ireland is such a beautiful place, isn't it? But, sorry, it is, but, but right now you're making me super homesick. I was going to say, I've do been, you miss I, it? Been, I've been home for over a year. Yeah. Um, you know, with the lockdown and everything. But I guess, you know, growing up at home, I mean, uh, I, I got interested even as a young boy, really, in the whole concept of working in healthcare or working as a doctor. Um, you know, when, uh, when you're a kid, you'd often ask your parents, you know, tell me about the day you got me from the hospital or the day I was born, you know, your children ask you that. I three, two daughters and a little son and they ask us that all the time. But when I was born, I had this thing called um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I was in an incubator and I was very poorly and very unwell. And so I would hear that story from my parents um, about how I was in like the intensive care unit and how my dad came in to visit me on the first day and the priest was there baptizing me in the in the in the intensive care unit because they you know they didn't expect me to make it out of there you know so uh, as a as a kid growing up um i mean i didn't carry any 
scars from that you know so zero memory of any of that you know and, and physically i didn't carry any scars from it but i would always relate hear that story about how amazing the doctors and the nurses were so it was always something that was out of great respect for healthcare. yeah and, just and then as can i just even jump in there because yeah, this is really interesting for me so what you're sort of saying already from a really young age you had this sort of inkling this sort of sense that maybe you wanted to move towards the, the medical profession was it there from that young age do you think that's what sort of set that that scene because i always see the medical profession a bit more like a vocation it seems to be something that people are drawn towards so it sounds like at a very early age that started to show up in your life it did really and i think my parents were very aware of it because that had been a very traumatic time for them and you know occasionally it's occasionally if we had any contact with a doctor or if i had to go to the hospital to visit a grandparent or something i would see the doctors and the nurses and i would see in a way like the reverence my parents had for them and recognize the work that they were doing and yeah so I, I, even as a kid i had a great um respect for healthcare professionals and what they do and then when it came to schooling and everything, I was, my parents had put a great emphasis on education and doing your homework and doing well at school since we were little. And so I was lucky enough to have the academic ability and the resources provided to me. So I was able to get into medical school and um, growing up in Cork, there's a great medical school in Cork, University College Cork, um, you know, on... Uh, you know, not that far from where I grew up, not too far from Blarney. So I was able to go to university, have the university life, um, but then go home in the evening to, you know, get all my laundry done, clean Perfect. bed, hot plate of food. So the best of both worlds. Um, I graduated medicine in 2001, went to Australia 2002 to 2003, and then came home in 2004 probably and got serious about my career and decided at that point in medicine, I wanted to, well, I've, I've just glossed over the first two or three years of your medical career, which are an absolute crucible. You know, you're doing 100, 130 hours at the hospital, seeing all sorts of difficult situations and coping with incredible stress, you know, 36 hour shifts were the norm then without recognized break time. So got through that whole crucible and in 2003, 2004, back from Australia, had to get serious about the career, um, decided I wanted to work in digestive health and gastroenterology. And what was the, and um, what was, what drew you towards that? Of all the different, you know, branches and, and strands that you could have followed, what, what drew you to the digestive part? Of yeah, medicine? well, look, it's, it, look, digestive health is really important. Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, usually when people ask me about why digestive health is important, I'll talk about, you know, the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, all health begins in the gut and how we know that that's now true. It really is true. And the gut microbiome and all that fascinating research and all mm -hmm. that research drew me in. But what really drew me in um, on a very practical level was the patients. Because as a young doctor in your 20s and you're used to working in big hospitals, in like I was in Cork University Hospital, it's a huge university hospital. And you get exposed to all the time to heart disease and cancer and stroke and disability and illnesses. The sort of illnesses that we view as inevitable in high income countries. But those are generally older people. So, you know, people look when you're a newly qualified doctor and you're in your early 20s, anyone over 50 is old, right? So, people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. So, you view those people as your patients, that you expect people to be in that age group. But within gastroenterology, when I was rotating through, I saw these different types of patients, these young people in their teens, 20s, and 30s, who were hospitalized on hospital wards alongside all these older folks with all these other um, West, so-called Western diseases. And they had serious problems whereby sections of their bowel were like badly inflamed, Crohn's mm. disease, ulcerative colitis. I saw young people who'd already had these conditions for eight or 10 years before I even met them. And they'd had parts of their bowel removed and they weren't able to function on a daily basis with tremendous support from doctors, dietitians, nurses. And this was a very different type of patient. And I think 
digestive health is so important. And if we're not able to enjoy our food and basically eat with our friends and celebrate with our friends and go to the bathroom when we choose to go to the bathroom, our quality of life goes, gets really bad really quick. So in gastroenterology, I found these patients with these conditions, young people, same age as me at the time, yeah. but they're in hospital on powerful medications and helping them to get better. And at the time within gastroenterology, um, we just had these kind of blockbuster new drugs available, the biologic drugs like infliximab was just, had just been licensed. And being involved in the diagnostic pathway and the treatment plan, and then seeing some of these same patients who've been bed bound and frail coming back to clinic in two or three months and, you know, they're far, far better and they bulked up and put on weight and become physically well. I remember this one um, young guy who I was very involved with his care. Um, he was a builder. He was one of these guys who was building, you know, fueling the uh, Celtic tiger. Yeah. He was a Polish chap who'd come to work in Ireland with his family. He was a builder. And when he came into hospital, he looked like a 12-year-old child. You know, he was underweight, very little muscle mass. He's pale, he's anemic. And I remember I did his camera test to look inside his bowel and diagnosed him with ulcerative colitis. And within 24 hours, we had him on this fancy new medication that was a, that was licensed at the time. And he went home and he came back to see me at clinic two or three months later. And he walked into the room like a different person. You know, he wow. looked exactly like you'd expect a busy builder in his mid-20s to look. Big, yeah. bulky guy, really healthy in, in, the, in peak physical condition. And just seeing the improvement in him and patients like him, I thought, well, wow, we, you can do a lot of good in gastroenterology. You can really improve yeah. people's health and their overall health. And also because it's a um, what we call in medicine a procedural specialty. So rather than looking at blood results and prescribing medications, which we do, you also do a procedure. So if you've got a patient who's got a stomach problem or a gut problem, one of the most important procedures you do is you take one of these wonderful bits of kit, an endoscope, and you look inside their body and you give them some sedation, put a tube, put a camera in. And we specialize in treating the, the stomach, the duodenum, the gut, the large bowel. But we can look at it in real time. We can look at the living organ that wow. we're treating. We can form an impression of what's wrong with it just by looking at it. And when you've done this for a long time, you, you just get used to looking at a stomach in a real live person with an endoscope and going, ah, I know what's wrong with them. I recognize this. And so there's something really, you know, tactile and interesting about a specialty that allows you to do that. So, so that's what attracted me to gastroenterology. I went on the consultant track, a lot of exams, a lot more hours in the hospital. Um, then met my wife when I was coming close to that point where I was going to be a consultant. And Hannah was um, from Devon. Oh, so she'd come over to visit. Yeah, so that was the, that was the hook. So, so Hannah the English came woman to brought you the Eng That's right. Oh, well, yeah. there's always a woman involved, generally, isn't there? <laughs> See, when when the an Irish man leaves the country, you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we left. Yeah. So 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 we so we lived together in Cork for a few years, and then as I became a consultant, we were trying to decide whether we'd live in Cork or would we live close to Hannah's home near Exeter. And at some point, it, it kind of dawned on me that given my career as a medic, and Hannah's a medic as well, uh, uh, she was heading towards a career in anesthetics. It occurred to me that there was a very reasonable chance that we'd end up living in a city that neither of us were from, because that's sort of how it goes with medicine. You know, you, yeah. you have to follow the jobs. And we didn't really fancy that. And as I came to the end of my consultant career, we were still sticking with that plan. I'd always worked in big university hospitals, Cork University Hospital, Oxford University Hospital. I spent a year working there as well. So we had our first child. And I'd always thought I would end up working at a big academic center, a kind of city hospital. And when I say city hospital, I mean a hospital the size of a city, which is in an even bigger city. Yeah. And th that's where I thought I'd end up working. And I'd taken a um, advanced fellowship in London at one of the big London hospitals. But very late in the day, 
uh, Hannah said, well, hey, there's a job in Southwest Devon, Tor Bay. It's not that far from where I grew up and we should go and maybe check it out. So I came down. I'd literally been up to London a few weeks earlier for the tour to meet my new boss and have a tour. And it was just very central London, very three-piece suit. I mean, you know, a long way academic, from Cork, put it that way. A long way from Cork. And yeah. I think academic academic doctors and doctors in big university hospitals in central London look a lot like brokers in yeah. central London. And the vibe is very similar and the pressure vibe is very similar. And you know, it's big, multi-story, shiny new building and everything. And I was like, well, I've arrived, you know, this is what I've been gunning for. A few weeks later, um, just to humor Hannah, I've come down to this other hospital um, to check out the vibe. And it's a, a former DGH, okay? Not very prestigious, but it's in the countryside. And there's outdoors and there's parks oh, yeah. and there's the Jurassic Coast and there's the Southwest, uh, you know, coastal path. And there's houses with gardens and there's fresh air and you get to do the same job. It's the yeah. same job. It's the same job title. And it just dawned on me at that point that as we were, we had a very small young family then and we knew our family was going to get bigger. It just made sense to come and work in, you know, here and near Hannah's parents as well, rather than being on that daily grind, the long commute involved in the London commuter you know i know that little, too well you know too well too yeah well. i can see you reminiscing yeah, yeah. right there so, i don't and i don't miss it and it's be beautiful that you know you've you've settled in devon which again as parts of the uk go it's probably closer to ireland there's that that sort of very much so, yeah. vibe very countryside vibe which i fell in love with ireland for in many ways and i just want to rewind you a little bit back to something you said you, you mentioned the, the greek the great wonderful greek hippocrats from you know about 400 bc talked about food being thy medicine and uh, medicine thy food and it's there isn't it these wonderful like ancient greeks and this is where arete comes from this lovely ancient word around uh meaning uh, fulfillment of one's purpose and excellence and whatnot and i love the learning that was there on a plate literally in this example for us and then fast forward and then you were talking about that early career in in the medical profession and the gastroenterology and and the digestive tract and Crohn's disease and all of these things and I, I remember you recalling a story that the big question that would often come up from these patients is what do I eat and I think you were talking about this back in 2005 and the prevailing wisdom of your mentors the, the people that were t teaching you and training you and you were learning from was it doesn't really matter and and I, I remember a story you talking about a 19 year old I don't know if it's the same chap and it, uh, the the senior medical uh, mm. person at the time was like if your mum comes along tell her to stop at Mackey D's get a McDonald's and bring a McDonald's down you know and I found that sort of fascinating and it's not that long ago is it we're not talking about you know no. 60 years ago we're talking about just a few years ago the prevailing wisdom in the medical profession even though all those clues are there you know back 500 400 BC that the, the prevailing wisdom was just get the calories in doesn't really matter about nutrition yeah, the whole concept that food, you know, calories are just calories and food doesn't really matter in human health is still something that a lot of doctors and health professionals believe. Yeah. But you're right. Hippocrates was talking about this, you know, two and a half thousand years ago. I was very lucky, Andy, in my medical training. I mean, along the way, you know, I discussed my first rotations in gastroenterology. I was very lucky to work under... Um, people like Professor Fergus Shanahan, Professor Raymond Quigley, who were at the time, and uh, I mean, Professor Shannon just retired fairly recently, they were world leaders in the field of gut microbiome research. So even then, you know, sh this is around the time the whole concept of the gut microbiota or the gut microbiome, uh, that that phrase had been first coined. I mean, we'd known that there was tiny little organisms living within our digestive tract since about the 1600s. They were called animilicules, which is a beautiful world, world kind of like molecules, you know, animilicule, yeah. tiny, tiny animals. But it was only in really in this century, 
that we started to figure out exactly how important the trillions of gut microbes that live within our digestive tract are and how they are a control center for human biology and how we can really harness the power of a healthier gut microbiome in order to improve our overall health. And I think I was very lucky to have that grounding during my training in gastroenterology. So gut microbiome research became something of a hobby for me. I went and I was employed by um, the elementary pharmacy, the elementary pharmacokinetic APC, I always get this wrong, Elementary Pharmobiotic Center in Cork University, in UCC for two years. And I know I've mangled what APC stands for. I always get it wrong. <laughs> but it's now called Microbiome Ireland. Much easier. Much easier. So I was employed there. And I initially, the first research project I was involved in was looking at the role of the gut microbiome in the pathogenesis of Crohn's disease. And then I got distracted with research on radiation exposure in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and gut health issues and actually produced a lot of really game changing research in that area. I mean, that was, gosh, 15 years ago now. And even to this day, when, you know, professional guidelines are written, for the investigation and evaluation of IBD. The, the research that I wrote then is still cited all the time. It, it's, wow. still, it's still very relevant. But the microbiome stuff just remained a hobby um, throughout my career. And it was particularly relevant to my patients, of course. So yeah. it's, one, it's one thing to read about how the gut microbiome influences human health and how the standard Western diet, which is a you know, a fruit and vegetable deficient, fiber deficient, plant deficient, meat heavy, dairy heavy, processed food heavy. It's one thing to read research papers about the negative effects that that has on your gut microbiome and human health. But it's another thing to see those adverse effects played out every single day on the yeah. ward and in your clinic. So patients, you alluded to the story before even, in my very first days in the gastroenterology ward, I noticed that patients would say, well, what about food, doctor? Is there anything I should eat or I shouldn't eat? And over the years during my training, I would look at those papers too. And those papers telling us what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat are there. The, the, the science is in the same medical journals that we learn about medication and surgery and procedures and colonoscopy and treatment strategies. It's all in there. You just need to read them. And I guess a lot of doctors don't view them as something that they need to read. They don't look at look at nutrition as being within their remit. And why do you think that is? And why do you think you were different in many ways, in the sense that there's been so many wonderfully bright, intelligent doctors coming through the, the medical system for all of these years when that research has been there? And it seems to be that not many people, and even as you suggested today, still haven't sort of made this connection. Well, like, why do you think you were different? And why do you think that that hasn't happened on a, on a mass scale? Well, well, the first thing, it's a real shame because within countries like the UK, Ireland and the US, food really does matter. And mm -hmm. in fact, the food that we eat, the, the way that we've been uh, uneducated or very efficiently miseducated by commercial interests and advertising, etc., means that the food that we consume now is a major driver of human disease. In the US, it's the number one driver of illness and healthy years lost in the UK and Ireland. It's second, it's still second to cigarettes, but it's going to become number one very soon. And conditions like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, etc. These are the things that doctors spend their time treating all the time because these are the diseases that rob us of healthy years and put us on prescription meds, etc. And we view them as inevitable. But there are people in the world who have a far healthier diet and lifestyle than the average person in the US, Ireland or the UK. And these diseases are either very, very uncommon or simply unheard of. So they're not inevitable. Yeah. For me, Andy, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure. I think the grounding that I had within the whole concept of the gut microbiome helped mm -hmm. a lot because I would look at those papers throughout my career because I always had an interest in them because my mentors very early on had mentioned them. And I would read about the effect that food was having and I would kind of join the dots. Yeah. And so that became very real and present for me. And by the time I'd become a consultant in 2012, you know, you're off that whole crazy, I don't know, is it a roller coaster or a merry-go-round? I'm not sure, but I'm struggling for the analogy, but I suddenly no longer had to work 110 hours 
several times, several weeks per month, and you know, uh, far less time was taken up by yeah. simply delivering the care that I needed to deliver. I'd also passed all my exams, and you know, I could ease off on the the prescribed curriculum for a while and free to specialize in other areas and read more research. And I was determined in my career that I would start to talk more and read more of this research. Also in about 2012, we'd moved to Devon. So it's my start in the consultant posts obviously coincided with moving to this lovely area, having more time on my hands, working, you know, 54 hours a week rather than 80 hours a week. And around that time, I became much more interested in looking after my own health. Uh, working as a, as a young doctor for all those years is a little bit like working like a broker. It's super pressured. You don't have any time for self-care. Your sleep is constantly interrupted. And generally, I mean, people know this. I mean, young doctors, the statistics around health and mental health and physical health for young doctors is atrocious. It, it's an incredibly stressful and difficult time. And what's interesting about that and, and the, the comparison there is with Broken, but in Broken, we don't have the knowledge that, that the medical profession does. And, it, and it's amazing, isn't it? And I think that's that, that just says so much that even though there's this wonderful grounding in, in what is good for you and what isn't good for you, you still find yourself in such pressurized situations that very often you're not doing any of the things that we're out there trying to encourage other people to do. Absolutely. And you're in medical school from, you know, from maybe your early 20s, then you're a young doctor and you're kind of your mid to late 20s. But you're constantly studying and working. Yeah. And you're involved in incredibly high pressure, stressful situations. You know, when I was a young doctor, you could be, you know, 26 hours into your shift. And over the course of a few hours, you might find yourself from being down in this dusty old storeroom where all the old fashioned, you know, big floppy x-rays are stored, searching through hundreds of x-rays to try and find the chest x-ray that your consultant will want to see in two hours time on the ward round. So you can go from that situation to a couple of hours later, assisting at an unsuccessful attempt to resuscitate a child. And then you go to the ward round and then you're in a room where someone has been told that they have cancer. And then you're involved in trying to, you know, optimize someone who's just developed chest pain and breathlessness. So it's, and that could, that just goes on and on and on. And it, it's a very, very stressful and difficult time. Why is that? Is that still sort of rite of passage or is that because there's not enough, you know, medical students? Like, why is that? Well, when I was started, it was viewed as a rite of passage, really, yeah. but also the only way to train. Thank God now our med our young doctors don't work quite like that. Yeah. It has improved an awful lot. It really, really has. And when I look at the young doctors who are now around me as a consultant, I see much healthier people. When we were young doctors, and I sound like a real old man now, I mean, you know, we would sometimes you would you would just turn up to work and you you hadn't dressed yourself properly. You might still be wearing your pajamas under your white coat, and you wouldn't even notice because you were just in a constant just, daze. Yeah, we're just just struggling through. Whereas, gladly, the young doctors who I work with now generally seem very well put together. They've got hobbies outside the hospital, and they've got outside interests. They don't just live at the hospital like we used to do. And I think that's a really good thing. But in 2012, having come out of, you know, 10 years of that system, I wasn't healthy. You know, yeah. I was overweight. Um, I was, you know, struggling a bit. And I thought, well, look, here is the point. I now no longer need to be at the hospital all these hours. Yeah. I'm the senior guy. I've got a bit more control over what I do day to day today. So I really focused on becoming fitter really got into exercise and really got into working out with a nice home gym and all the rest of it. And around that time, Andy, to help to keep me on track, I remember I've always been a big podcast fan and I remember Googling um, inspiring athlete interviews. So I thought, that's what I'll do. I'll, rather than just listening to medical education, I'll listen to some inspiring athletes and that will inspire me. And I discovered this podcast um, where Josh Lajoni, this guy who'd been terribly overweight and become an athlete, was being interviewed by a chap called Rich Roll. 
And I listened to that. So that must have been in maybe 2014 or 2013. Yeah, yeah it would have been about 2013. Yeah, because we we're not long here in, in Devon. So I listened to Josh's story been interviewed by this fascinating guy called Rich Roll. And it was such an incredible episode of this relatively new podcast at the time that I've hardly missed an episode since. And on the Rich Roll podcast, I soon heard from doctors like Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. Garth Davis and mm -hmm. Dr. Michael Clapper. So these were doctors who also cared about instructing their patients on the evidence-based answers to that question what should I eat? What are the foods that I should eat? And all of these doctors had arrived years before me at the same conclusion that in order to be healthy, we need to unprocess our diet, push back against this, the standard Western diet and eat very few, if any, animal products. And hearing those doctors speak so forthrightly about this issue really started to give me the confidence to start speaking to my patients about it and reading Dr. Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die, but not just reading it, but also going through all the studies that he references research, yeah. and reading that research and then bouncing over to other research. And I'd seen papers like this over the years specific to the areas of, that I was interested in, but to go really deep into it was fascinating. So that was like 2012, 2013. I just jumping and in there, I, I just want to yeah. say as well, that's the power of podcasts. I'm not just saying that because we're recording one right now, but just thinking back to Rich Rolves, he's a hero of mine. I was so lucky to appear on that podcast. We need to get you on there, by the way. We need to make that happen. But the point that would be awesome. that, you know, that opened your mind up to these other medical professionals that had already made these conclusions that then gave you the confidence to start to go back and look deeper into the research and into the studies, which has given you more confidence. That's the sort of thing that just didn't exist as much prior to podcast because mm. those people weren't on our radar. You couldn't access them like that. Or maybe you'd see them in a conference once a blue moon. But if you weren't really interested in those type of things, you probably would never have gone to that conference. But here you were just listening to a podcast Absolutely. and these people were just appearing, you know, Neil Bernard, Dr. Greg, all these wonderful people, Joel Furman, they were the people that I listened to as well. It's so inspirational. And the fact that that then influenced you, I think is, is so incredibly powerful. Hugely. And just to go off on a, a kind of a segue here, just it, it's also something that connects you mm. with other people and helps you to build this network that you may never have built. So funnily enough, Andy, so it was so I'm listening to the Ritual podcast. So my phone or my browser recommends the No Meat Athlete podcast. So that must have been 2015, 2016. So I listened to the one listen to that podcast. And there's this ginger vegan guy called Andy <laughs> Andy Ramage on there talking about why he gave up alcohol. And when you talked about your journey through brokering and the high pressure environment and how alcohol consumption was part of entertaining your clients, but also de-stressing, that completely resonated with me too, because I just described what our lives were like as young doctors. But we had very little time outside the hospital. And as you came to the end of your 36 hour shift and you were sitting in the hospital canteen, half asleep, shoveling unhealthy food just to, down your throat, just to keep you awake, you know, you would meet some other doctor who was on call that night with you. And what would they say? You're going to the pub afterwards? Go for a pint. Yeah, there's a lovely bar just across the street from the hospital. And that bar was like the unofficial staff room because you would just move from the end of an incredibly stressful period you know in the hospital or an incredibly stressful week and you didn't know anybody else outside of work you only socialized with your hospital friends because that's where you lived so you would just grow you would just kind of move across the street and have a few pints and that, would, that was the only coping mechanism that we really had yeah. as young doctors to our detriment. So hearing you speak about that back in, I think it was in 2014 or 15, really resonated with me. So I jumped on board the one year no beer train. That's right. Which was, which was fantastic. Go forward another year. So now I've been a consultant for three or four years at this point. 
And I've started having these conversations with my patients and seeing the benefits it has to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Just simple stuff, eat more whole grains, eat more fruits, eat more vegetables, quit dairy. These conversations are going on, okay? So I was part of the first one year No Beer Masterclass, which you oversaw. And as Six part of course, that, yeah. Yeah, six week course. And we'd had contacts. I'd met you at a few socials. There was one in Dublin along the way. Um, and as part of the masterclass, we were due to have a conversation. You and I telephone check in. So at that time, I was at a conference in Leuven in Belgium, um, a conference on inflammatory bowel diseases, one of the best conferences on the calendar for for this particular area because it's in Leuven so it's a beautiful university town it's a small conference but they get really high caliber speakers so it's a chance to meet the experts the global experts and and chat with them and have a coffee and discuss so i'm at that conference and we had a phone call for an hour and of course we didn't talk about alcohol free adventures because we were all already several years down that line both of us we ended up talking about food and plant-based nutrition. And I explained to you how I was at this conference about inflammatory bowel disease and hearing about all the wonderful new medications that were coming on stream and how best to use them, which is, which is a really important part of my practice, of course. But when I sat in the room and listened to one of the national experts or global experts talking about the research papers that we needed to produce in the field of inflammatory bowel disease, he only talked about medication. He didn't even mention food and nutrition, which is a really important role to play. And I explained to you how in the room, I'd asked a question of this expert, basically like those questions that people ask on like question time or whatever. Yeah. So a, a, a question that was really a statement about how important nutrition is for our patients and how it felt like someone had just left off a stink bomb in the room <laughs> because the, this expert just started shaking his head. And if there'd been security in the room, I, I think yeah. they would have just like, I should get out. that guy out of here. You know, I would have got the old Donald Trump treatment, you know, take him out the back, you know. But, and talking about how there was such a disconnect. And during that conversation, you said, oh, I just, I've got to introduce you to this guy called Dr. Tom Hubbard. I met him at the Rich Roll Retreat That's in right. Cork, yeah, Tom. which is one I, I, I mean, I couldn't go to that because I was committed to work and I was follow anyway, Look, a rich roll retreat in my old stomping ground in my old backyard, but I couldn't go. I just had to work at the hospital, but that's fine. But so you'd been there and you connected me with Tom Hubbard. So I phoned Tom and I say, hey, Tom, at this point, I'd only talked to other or only heard from other plant-based physicians or physicians who recommend a whole food plant-based diet um, through podcasts and interviews and books. So Tom was the first fellow that I'd spoken to who was on the same track as me. And I said, hey, Tom, Andy gave me your number. Um, you're, you know, we, we both promote the same thing. We just had a little chat about it. And he said, oh, we're organizing a conference in London on plant-based nutrition with um, Dr. Shreen Kazam at UCL in London. Would you like to speak at it? I'll connect you. I was like, fantastic, connect me with Dr. Kazam. So I spoke to Shireen on the phone. And she said, yes, I am also passionate about this. And we're trying to organize a conference big fancy medical conference in London. Um, would you like to speak at it about inflammatory bowel disease and the role of plant-based nutrition? I said, of course, please. Fantastic. So I agreed to speak at that conference. And that was the first major conference on plant-based nutrition held in the UK. It was accredited for you know uh, medical training. It's like an official conference. And I remember going there and speaking there and uh, you know, meeting a whole panel of other doctors and people who are now friends and becoming a founder member of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, which grew out of that first conference. And I remember thanking Shireen um, for inviting me at, as I was getting ready to leave. And she said, oh, of course, Alan, you know, you were the first person to say yes. Really? And it's like, really? And she said, yes, you were, you were the first person who said yes, which gave me the confidence to, or, you know, to keep inviting people. So it's such a virtuous circle, Andy. Yeah. And funnily enough, you've played a big part in it yourself. So thank you. Yeah, and it's been very organic seeing it grow. And as we, we worked together on that, that original mastermind, which was, I think it was the first ever one that, that, that I'd actually run. And to see your story unfold, you know, towards where you are now, you know, this sort of world leader in many ways in plant-based whole food nutrition. And my go-to guy, you know, and just to sort of 
play it back to you that, you know, the, the world of nutrition is so full of noise, isn't it? And that's the thing about nutrition. Maybe we can talk about that. Mm. Everyone's got an opinion, you know, and, and my approach always is if you care what you eat, that's probably the, the, the best foundation to start with, that you care what's going into your body, whether you end up being, you know, paleo, Mediterranean or plant-based. I think if there is that foundation of you start to care and then when you start to care, then you can dig a bit deeper into the type of nutrition mm. that works best for you. And they're overwhelming. I mean, it's not just a little bit of science now. It's overwhelming science suggesting that whole food, plant-based nutrition is the optimal diet for for most people and it certainly was for me in, in, in my own research and that's where it got really interesting and exciting for me was that my my dad and th and this features in in your book actually this story but the story behind that is just to quickly go into that my dad was minutes away probably minutes days away from a major heart attack well the actual uh, cardiologist described it a blockage in the artery is not conducive to life it was on a major artery by fluke, he didn't have the heart attack. He just found it in advance, rushed into hospital, treble bypass later, fine. He's fit as a fiddle, better shape than he's ever been. But on the back of that, me and my two brothers said, right, let's go and get tested out. Let's just check our own hearts out because it's probably, you know, there's genetics involved. Of course, my mm. two other brothers, totally fine, clear bill of health. At that point, I was three stone heavier, drinking a lot unbelievably stressed out, incredibly unfit, incredibly unhealthy. And I'd fallen into that trap that so many people do that, and Dr. Phil Maffetone, someone I admire, has got this lovely quote, and it's, the absence of illness does not imply health. And I was firmly in that bracket, and I think so many people are in that bracket. I wasn't sick, therefore I must be healthy, right? In my mind, that, that what I was doing must have been okay. The fact that I was still abusing my body in all sorts of different ways. And I then got tested and I showed up on the calcium score, which is a score to see if there's furring of the arteries in many ways. When I should have been a zero, I was a very low score at the time, but I early on set heart disease. And then in that research led me to a plant-based nutrition. And my first meeting with Dr. Gupta, who is a brilliant cardiologist, but this is where that, that whole um, separation comes between the, the new medical professionals and the old school and and dr gupta was old school and i remember going to get these results and at one point he never ever mentioned nutrition or alcohol or anything it was very much this is a genetic thing there's some pills off you go and that for me you know i, I was quite saddened by i remember leaving just feeling really deflated and saddened like oh is, is, is sort of that air and it wasn't through that research then that I uncovered about plant-based nutrition I started to, to spend a lot more time with yourself and our sort of stories around the whole plant-based thing evolved together which has been so cool and just to quickly finish that story because it is important because it does finish uh, feature in the book at that point as mentioned when I first saw Dr. Gupta I actually remember walking to the to the uh, the medical practice and I passed a Donna kebab shop Right, and it was like one of those cartoon moments. I sort of paused and rewound and thought to myself, this could be my last ever opportunity to have a doner kebab. <laughs> and two seconds later, right, and no one eats a doner kebab sober, do they? Two seconds later, I was in there, large doner, chili sauce, <laughs> give it to me, the whole shebang. Ten minutes later, I'm back in with Dr. Gupta and he gives me the, the bad news. But you know what the sad thing is and the important thing in many ways is I did nothing about it, nothing. You know, I went back a year later hadn't stopped drinking, still overweight. I did the same trick with the doner kebab. I was like, right, maybe this is it. This is the final one. You know, a year later, so that's two doner kebabs later. And then I got in there again and nothing had changed. It was like nothing's happening. Um, but something had changed that this seed had started to sow in my mind around alcohol and, and I sort of left and I wanted something to cling to. And I sort of said as a parting gift, I'm going to give up alcohol. You know, that was the sort of one thing that could come out and I did, you know, and, and that has led to this wonderful, you know, experience in my own life. But I went back then a year later, and this is the story in the book, I'd lost the free stone in weight. My body fat had gone from 35% down to below 10%. I walked into the room and Dr. Gupta was like, this is astounding. It was like his brain, he was almost scratching his head, the, you know, the whole way through it as if this is not supposed to happen. People are not supposed to be able to make behavioral change on their own back, you know, my years of experience have told me people can't change. And here I was looking like a completely different person. My resting heart rate had gone from 76 to 42. 
I mean, it's unbelievable when you think about it. You know, I looked like a different person. And then he brought me in and he's, this is astounding. This is staggering. He went, and we've looked at your, the, the, the calcium score again and the, 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 the x-rays around it. And it looks as though, and he's like really confused when he's telling me, he's like, it looks as though you've paused the heart disease. And, he, and then he called the guy in, literally, the trick, called the guy in. He said, we've got to talk this through. He said, because it sort of looks like you might have reversed it. But for him, this was like total confusion in his mind, you know, that, that this could have happened. And I, I know now, I'm just looking at you, but the research is there, isn't it? That's exactly what can happen. And that was various lifestyle changes, whether it was 100% down to the plant-based whole food diet that I'd adopted. I'm sure the factors were as well that I'd stopped drinking and I'd lost weight and de-stressed. But the culmination of those things, it's in my story, is that that heart disease was paused, if not, reversed mm. and i think that's just it's, it's, it's so cool and, and it was a lovely story to be able to share in your book as well oh and it's lovely to have that in my book and I, i'm sure it's, it'll inspire a lot of people it's important to, in a book like that to have real life stories so i've got a lot of patient stories in the book and when i was writing the section on heart disease i thought oh i know a guy who's got an incredibly powerful patient story so it was cool to ring you up and say look can you can we put your story in my book but What's for doctors and health professionals who begin to talk about their about food and nutrition and diet and lifestyle to their patients? Although most doctors have this preconception that it's futile and patients don't want to hear it, my experience is the exact opposite: is that patients really do want to hear it. And in, of course, there'll always be the occasional patient who says, "Yeah, I'm not doing any of that." But uh, for most people, they value your opinion and they value the fact that you've read the research and you've got some resources and directions that you can point them in. And when we talk to our patients about food in particular, because it's such an important driver of, of, of poor health, the sort of consultation that Dr. Gupta had with you becomes pretty regular and becomes something that happens in your practice all the time. And that's really what's spurred me on. You know, in, in the book, I share the story of a young woman who'd come to see me at my gastroenterology clinic. And so she's in her 30s. She's got, she's pre-diabetic. So she's on the road to type 2 diabetes. Or in fact, no, she was established type 2 diabetes. So she had type 2 diabetes on medication. She's living with obesity. She has endometriosis, severe abdominal pain, probably has adhesions, PCOS, all of these conditions that we think is just part of normal life in the UK. You know, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of women in their 30s who, who have this list of diagnoses in the UK right now. And she had seen lots and lots of specialists. It was her, her, um, her gynae had referred her over to me because she'd already had exploratory surgery to try and fix her tummy. She'd had lots of visits to the emergency room and we started a conversation and I sent her off to have another scan and a few other tests and things um, from a GI perspective. I didn't turn up anything significant, but I had these basic conversations with her around food. She took a lot of dairy. So we talked about cutting that back, eliminating it. She'd been warned not to eat fruits and vegetables because carbs make you fat, which just isn't true if you're eating whole carbohydrates. They, don't, they help you to maintain a healthy body weight. And she'd also been warned that the sugar in fruit would make her diabetes worse. And for type two diabetics, that just isn't true. And these are the foods that help to control her blood sugars. So I pointed her in a few directions and she agreed that she would actively try and correct her fiber deficiency and at this point, I've got resources on my website at my clinic that I can point my patients to. So if they, you know, give them one or two things to work on and say, also, could you just do your homework and have a look through this and look at improving your kind of plant-based diet score? You know, you don't have to go fully plant-based, just keep pushing in that direction. And then a few months later, she's back in the office and the tests I've sent her for have come back clear. So that's good news. But also, she's lost a significant amount of body weight without even trying. Her, her type 2 diabetes control is better than it's ever been before. In fact, she's almost at the point where her um, HbA1c reading is normal. 
so she's entering remission from her type 2 diabetes. Her abdominal bloating and distension and severe abdominal pain, which had landed her in multiple doctor's offices over the years and the emergency department, has resolved. And her quality of life was completely turned around. And uh, there's other stories like that in the book, too. And when you're having those Dr. Gupta moments on a regular basis, it, it becomes impossible for you to stop talking to your patients about diet and lifestyle. Yeah, and just what's really important, what you said there is, and this is my experience around medical professionals, we do really trust you, you know, and, and because of that gravitas that you have around the research and, and the stature and the, the, the years of training. But equally, I think a lot of people's experience is, I just wanna get in and get out as quick as I can. So almost mm. I don't hear anything that I don't want to hear. And that was my experience. I just want to get in and hopefully doesn't say anything too horrific and then I'm out. Because if I don't hear it, then I don't, you know, it's back to that. If, if you know, the absence of, of illness, it's the same thing. So that was my interest. So had Dr. Gupta sat me down, I was incredibly interested in what he had to say. But equally, I wasn't going to go fishing for it because I didn't want to hear it, but I did want to hear it. Do you know what I mean? It's that weird situation. And I would have been incredibly influenced by someone sitting me down and saying, what about your nutrition? What about alcohol? As it yeah. transpires, I went and did all that work myself, but I know I'm exceptional in many ways in that regard that most people wouldn't. They'll just come out, slip back into their normal ways and then end up back in the same place before. So I think it's so wonderful now that that awareness is starting to shine through. As you said, it's not with every medical professional, but it's definitely starting to, to come through. And, and it's, just... enter, it's entering the mainstream though, Andy, you know? Yeah. So in, 20, in 2019, and I promised you I wouldn't um, talk about medical studies and research today because we didn't want to have that kind of podcast, right? But in 2019, the Lancet Medical Journal, one of the oldest and most respected medical journals in the world, they published the report of a commission that they had set up to answer this incredibly important question, what should I eat? That's the same question that 19-year-old man had asked me back in 2003, 2004. And it's the same question my patients ask me all the time, what should I eat? And they had gone off and looked at all the evidence on food and human nutrition and food production, et cetera. And they'd come back with what became known as the Eat Lancet plate or the, eat, or the planetary health plate. And they determined with no, you know, agenda other than improving the health of everybody in a world where food has become a potent driver of disease. That was their only agenda. And they came back with a planetary health plate, which they described as, you know, in broad brush strokes, half your food should be fruits and vegetables, about a quarter should be whole grains. Um, and the rest should be made up of particularly protein-rich plant foods like legumes with the, a little bit of healthy plant-derived oils like olive oil. And then optionally, and only optionally, should you include small amounts of animal products. And they talked about an ounce of chicken or fish per day, seven grams of red meat per day, which means eating red meat maybe every couple of weeks, and no processed meat at all, so no sausages, bacon, or anything like that. And they estimated when they made those recommendations that if we could you know, flick a switch and get the world to eat like that, which is how I've been kind of asking my patients to eat for years, we could prevent 12 million lives lost every year globally, not to mention hundreds of millions of trips to the emergency room, to the coronary cath lab, to the chemotherapy suite, to the surgeon's office to have half your bowel removed because you've got colorectal cancer or Crohn's disease. So the food choices are incredibly important. But for me, that seeing that publication in one of the you know most major medical journals in the world was an absolute red letter day in terms of the recommendations that I've been making to my patients for years. But on a very personal level, that paper was published in, I think, February 2019. And in February 2019, I was presenting on the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet um, for inflammatory bowel disease at a conference in Melbourne, Australia. And I was sitting having lunch with Dr. Neil Bernard, who was an absolute hero yeah, and a, an inspiration to me and one of those doctors that I'd heard on the Ritual podcast all those years ago. So I'm sitting next to Neil Bernard having lunch 
and just chatting and catching up and getting to know the guy. And he's an absolutely lovely chap. Uh, you know, uh, I think he's from Dakota. I can't remember if he's North or South Dakota, but he's like a really softly spoken gent. And I said to him, hey, have you read the uh, Eat Lancet report? And he said, no, no, I haven't read it. What is it? And then I found myself sitting, having lunch with Neil Bernard and explaining the Eat Lancet report to him. And for me, that was just a complete full circle, yeah. such a surreal moment and such a lovely moment that now I'm sitting with the man who's taught me so much about nutrition and I'm giving him a little tutorial, a little intro to this paper that I've just read. And that was professionally, personally, what a, what a lovely moment. Yeah. And, and, and these guys are all heroes of, of yours and of, of mine. And it's, it is wonderful to, to see you sort of now on this, I guess, this world stage promoting this wonderful way to, to, to eat and to live and lifestyle medicine as well. I wanted to touch on that as it's becoming slightly bigger. I, you know, I've done some work with Dr. Laura Freeman, uh, Nilesh Satguru. I did a talk actually for his medical students just recently who were taking an option around lifestyle medicine, which was I mean, it's it's just, it's just wonderful. And, and the combination of all the things, not only nutrition, but also taking a break from alcohol, which has to be a huge part of lifestyle medicine, in my opinion, forest bathing, you know, all these things that felt slightly alternative not so long ago are becoming so much more mainstream. And I think, you know, it's really exciting and encouraging going forward for the younger generation and for equally for the, the, the more senior generation that we're starting to understand, oh, it's back to what, you know, Hippocrates said all those two and a half thousand years ago, let, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And I think the penny's dropping on a real cultural mm. level. It, I don't know if you've noticed that, but it really feels like in the last five years or so, all of this stuff speeding up. You know, it's really becoming much more mainstream. And obviously the, the vegan movement's just exploded in, in many different um, forms. Um, and, he, and the same way around alcohol-free, I think people are starting to figure this stuff out, which I think is, is it's just, it's really encouraging, I think, going forward. I think in a way, the um, in the same way that the kind of alcohol-free concept and the, you know, the, well, it's, it's in the title of my book, right? This plant-based diet revolution, it's yeah. entering the mainstream, right? It's being predominantly driven in a way by consumer demand. So the consumers are demanding this. Yeah. And so the companies that determine what's on our shelves are responding to that demand. And in a way, the same thing is happening in medical education. So there was a nice article just this week in the journal Frontiers in Medicine. Oh, that, excuse me, the Future Medicine Journal, which is a journal published by the Royal College of Physicians here in the UK. And it was about the need for standards and requirements within medical education for education on the role of nutrition in medicine, and which still isn't something that the General Medical Council views as a mandatory part of medical training. So until the General Medical Council make it a mandatory part of training, it won't become a mandatory part of training because it... it you know, there'll be no requirement for it. But gladly, medical students across this country and other countries are calling for change. And that article was written by medical students and young doctors who are calling for change because whatever their approach to human nutrition, they're recognizing that it is really, really important. And I've had the opportunity to speak to lots of medical students, thank goodness, and give them lectures and, you know, share the evidence that's really shaped my career. Um, but in most cases so far, the invitation has come from the student body rather than the university itself. So speaking for, you know, medical societies or just yesterday, I did this incredible event for the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, which is a medical school. Um, so uh, myself and Stephen and David Flynn of the Happy Pair did like a two-hour event where I talked about the benefits of plant-based eating, and then Stephen Dave demonstrated a few uh, cooking demos. Excellent. But again, that was a, that was an invitation from the students, yeah. rather than from the institute. And I think once this stuff becomes part of the core medical curriculum, the whole sector of medical education around food and nutrition will really, really take off. Um, I've been very, very um, proud in the last year or two to be involved with Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. 
so the last several years to be involved with Plant-Based Health Professionals UK and to be an ambassador for that group because focusing on educating our colleagues, patients, public members of uh, you know, patient groups, student groups, policymakers, et cetera, is those are our key goals. And we were all involved in setting up a course at the University of Winchester a few years ago on you know kind of a, a, an accredited course on the benefits of a whole food plant-based approach to food. So those resources are starting to appear, which is wonderful. Yeah, which is in, is incredibly ex- exciting, I think, across the board in, in the whole space around nutrition and lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine, just to explain just briefly, is um, a concept where you will be prescribed, you know, almost written prescription to exercise or to eat a whole food plant-based diet or to reduce your alcohol intake by medical professionals that have studied the research and understand your issues and and what you might need and what what you don't need so it's just this wonderful take on a different angle of of the medical profession which which i really like which is is a growing profession and we'll get into that in more detail i'm going to have laura onto the podcast most definitely Oh, wonderful laura's awesome and you know the professionals are making this happen now we're we're not waiting for the medical schools to catch up with the science um as you know last year 2020 um, we ran an initiative here in Southwest where we recruited 150 health professionals, uh, doctors, nurses, dietitians, clerical staff, receptionists, and we challenged them to try a whole food plant-based diet themselves for 28 days. We called it the Southwest Plant-Based Diet Challenge, and it wouldn't have happened without the wonderful Stephen and David Flynn who brought all of their energy and enthusiasm to the game. So we had 150 health professionals who for 28 days went from eating a standard British diet, southwest of England diet, a lot of red meat, processed meat, a lot of dairy, um, clotted cream and all that jazz. And they went from that to having, you know, bean burritos and fruits and vegetables every single day. No calorie counting, no portion control. And over 28 days, they recorded some incredible numbers. The individuals with high cholesterol dropped their cholesterol by up to 40% in just four weeks on this high fiber cholesterol free diet without counting a single calorie The people who were obese or overweight lost an average of five kilos or 11 pounds. And we had loads of doctors moving from obese out of the obese bracket, which was incredible. And they also saw substantial benefits in their blood pressure. So the health professionals who were living with elevated blood pressure, so improvements in their blood sh- pressure, the equivalent of taking one or two anti-hypertensive medications. And that really lit a lot of enthusiasm yeah. in our local area. And some of my colleagues have um, continued with that enthusiasm. I'm really delighted that in our own locality now, we have a project or a a program called the Whole Life Program, which is a exactly as you described, a diet and lifestyle prescription where we can GPs in our locality who have individuals who are suffering with high blood pressure, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, or any of those common problems can refer into the six week program where they are educated on getting some exercise, eating a whole food plant-based or plant predominant diet with all the same recipes we used last year, but also given instruction on mindfulness and alcohol avoidance, et cetera. And we're seeing some really incredible results. So you can make this stuff happen uh, even without very many resources, actually, you know, so so it's um, very cost effective for the health service, too. Yeah. And this is where you find yourself now, don't you? You've got this dual role in many ways. You're still an acting gastroenterologist. And, and now you're this sort of beacon of not only plant based whole food nutrition, but of health. And I think it's so important. I, you know, I think it's really important that we see our health care professionals looking healthy and exuding in many ways and becoming that role model and we're seeing a lot of that now which is fantastic but i think you're such a shining example of that and just to speak to this before we get to towards towards the wrap up is that you know your meaning and purpose now that you found in this vocation i guess through the medical profession feels like it's gone up a level or you've got a vocation within the vocation or meaning within your purpose which is now around plant-based uh, nutrition. I don't know how you feel about that, but do you feel that's something that's going to, you know, fill you with purpose for for the coming years? Yeah, I mean, the benefits that I see in in people who are educated on this are are, are astounding. And like I said, one of my main goals is to continue 
educating people on the evidence-based answers to the question, what should I eat? Because it's so important and it's a question that people ask themselves three times a day, basically. And trying to bring those resources out there. And I think, you know, in the in the plant-based health um, sector, if you want to call it that, I don't, I don't know if that exists, but in that sector, it can often be viewed as a kind of an elitist, middle-class, expensive, difficult thing and a luxury to be able to eat healthy food. So keep it, as well as, you know, writing the book and being involved in wonderful podcasts like this podcast and going to events and all those things, which are really great fun and give me the fuel I need, you know, physically, psychologically to keep this thing going. I, I think it's really important that we, as health professionals, continue to work um, towards this within at the NHS, which is where most people get their health care in the UK, and help to try and continue talking about this publicly and advocating and speaking to policymakers and fund holders and decision makers so that we can make this diet and lifestyle approach to, to medicine and health part of the healthcare experience for more and more and more people within the UK without any cost attached and without any expense attached because the changes that we're talking about Andy so you know spending time outdoors eating more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and rice and beans not drinking much alcohol or no alcohol these aren't expensive choices. These are very, very cost-effective choices, and they shouldn't be viewed as complex or elitist or difficult. So both my kind of side hustle and my advocacy and my NHS work and my public life and my private life right now are all very aligned with each yeah. other, and that's, that's a great way to be. That's a great way to be. So I'm not sure what the next few years will hold, but if I can just keep hold of these, you know, my advocacy, my NHS work and spending time with my family and continuing to have conversations like this with incredible people I admire like you, then I'll be pretty happy. Yeah, as will I, because you're just doing such a, a, a beautiful job. And I'm so proud, actually, of everything that that you've achieved and, and that you do in, in general. But it's it's a wonderful thing to see your I think your influence, your positive influence starting to grow broader and wider as you make more connections and, and through your wonderful book. And one thing I just wanted to say about the book, just before we do get to the close, I'm conscious of your time, is that many of my heroes in the plant-based space are American and Canadian. Brendan Brazier is another one that just comes to mind. Rich Roll and I love all these guys and girls that have been so influential on my thinking and your thinking and I would buy all their books and we'd get to the recipe section of all their books and they'd have all this fancy stuff. And I'd be like, what is that? I don't even know what that, that yeah. thing is. Like, what is cilantro? <laughs> exactly. Unless you live next door to Whole Foods or Planet Organic, you know, in London, you go into your local Tesco's and your Sainsbury's, the, the choices are so limited. And I used to find it really frustrating. It used to sort of put me off. It was a bit of a... I couldn't quite get into some of the, the recipes because I didn't have half the, the ingredients. And what I love about your book, and it's really, really important, obviously you're this side of the pond and all the ingredients, I think you said it, have passed the supermarket test. You can go to your Sainsbury's, you can go to your Tesco's and be confident that everything that you're going to see in the recipes is there. That for me was, you know, it might sound a little thing, but for me, that was a huge thing in embracing this book. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that I said that to people listening um, because if you're this side, I think it's it's really important that, that it just lowers that barrier, barrier to entry. When Bob and I were working on the recipes and Bob's an incredibly accomplished chef, that was like a really important part of this whole thing, that the the food isn't shouldn't be exotic it shouldn't be difficult it shouldn't be unachievable it shouldn't be niche now when we were writing the book we had a few kind of rules you know we had the sainsbury's test so you had to be able to get the ingredient at your local um supermarket and we built the recipes of the healthiest foods available at the supermarket fruits and vegetables whole grains nuts beans seeds leafy greens etc those are the only ingredients in there but we had kind of a few touchstones which were things like you know no jackfruit 
no chia seeds. Yeah. You know, th these things would come up every now and then. But remarkably, of course, you can buy jackfruit and Get chia now, seeds yeah. in Sainsbury's now. Yeah, they're everywhere. But we wanted to avoid um, ingredients that would seem niche or intimidating or difficult for people. So I think the most exotic ingredient that we use is tofu. Um, which you can get at every most supermarkets. I like saying it passes the Sainsbury's test. They've got like three different kinds of tofu now, and that's like a super healthy food. It's basically a legume turned into a block, which you can, which is incredibly versatile and healthy ingredient. So I think that's the most exotic ingredient in there. Yeah, and and that for me has, has made it so much easier for for myself and my girls and Tara and everyone just to literally flick open a page of the book, right. Let's go. Uh, and we're off. And, and I just wanted to get that across because I think it is really important. And that can, again, be a little barrier sometimes between people starting because they're like, well, what's the point? I haven't got all the ingredients. You have. There's no excuse. Give it a go. It's very much like the alcohol-free thing in many ways. It's like, what have you got to lose? Like, all this research is there. Just go and try it. And you'll, you'll find very quickly, not only is it very cost-effective, which you rightly mentioned, it's easy, it's versatile, it tastes delicious, you feel amazing, what's not to give it a go you know and i'm always really excited when you come and deliver one of your, your talks because you're so you know it, it's it's such a wonderful experience so many people are like right i'm going to give it a go and then i start to see the results from your great work that's with, amazing with the people that I, I work with which is which is truly exciting and in the book as well i've just tried to break down in a very easy way the research about why this is a super healthy way to eat because i think for a lot of people they may still have that um I remember you telling me a long time ago that when you told your mum that you were going to eat a plant-based diet, a vegan diet, she said, you can't do that or your teeth will fall out because <laughs> that, was, that was her lived experience. She knew this one vegan in the 70s who had bad teeth. And so she thought that she you know, counseled you to avoid it because all your teeth would fall out. But of course, the evidence around health and nutrition and eating more whole plant-based foods is incontrovertible now. And it's just given, you know, knowledge is power. So if you give people you know, the evidence and they can read the papers and see how this is endorsed now by the British Dietetic Association, the American Academy of um, Diet and Nutri uh, Nutrition, you know, uh, the American Cancer Society and all of these incredible professional organizations of doctors and dietitians and health experts who agree that a vegetarian or vegan diet that focuses on unprocessed foods is incredibly healthy, maybe the healthiest way to eat. It gives people the confidence moving forward to cook these delicious meals and to have a big bowl of, you know, a winter barley stew with wholemeal dumplings or whatever, and to eat that meal and to know they're only eating ingredients and foods that benefit human health and have the confidence to sit there. And when someone says to them, oh, why haven't you put beef in there? Why isn't there chicken in there? To have the confidence to say to that person, you don't need it, buddy. You don't need it. This is healthier because it's not in there. Yeah, and it's so true. And it is always that protein conversation as well that, that we won't go into now. We'll save that for round two. But I always think about, you know, I think you were talking about some gorilla type studies in in the book almost that here they are these huge and horses look at some of these wonderful like the most you know sculpted and muscular and impressive animals in the animal kingdom what they eating all day long plants you know so that That's for right. me i know it's it's an obvious one but it's so true and even back to my mom there you know that miss um interpretation of those misconceptions are starting to change and i see it in my own children now you know my mom saying don't eat just plants because your, your teeth will fall out your skin will go pasty i was like mum that was 50 years ago they probably had scurvy i think scurvy was probably still <laughs> around then you know and here you are like you're counseling me 50 years later based on this one thing and i think that's the big change isn't it i think that the children growing up the, the education people are understanding these things the mythologies being pushed out that i think it's only hopeful for the future so on that note, I, I wanted to, to wrap it up there. I know we've gone a bit over time. Just to thank you so much, uh, Alan. We will do this again, absolutely. Um, it was just nice to hear the story behind the story and see, in many ways, your journey towards more meaning and purpose, which started almost as a young boy into the medical profession. And then through your courage and many twists and turns, here you are now as this, this wonderful advocate for you know healthy living and, and plant-based nutrition. And I thank you for sharing that message because it's an incredibly important one. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Andy. Lovely to spend uh, an hour and a half chatting with you. Yeah. All right. Let's wrap it up there. Let's do this. 
problem.